All right. Galatians chapter 6. You can turn there in your Bible. Galatians chapter 6. The final week here. Six weeks going through the book of Galatians. We're going to cover the last and final chapter of Galatians. Starting here at verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one uh, in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Very important thing for you to remember when dealing with other Christians is found here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. It says, For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. You know, we think that our lives are so important and that, that our lives are just, you know, we're just going to live and we've lived for so long and all this other stuff. But actually the truth of the matter is all flesh is as grass. All of us are corruptible. All of us, we're really not going to live that long on the earth. And we are all very, very weak and very fragile. Uh, I don't care who the strongest man is out there. He's still weak and fragile. He still could be killed very quickly. Uh, naturally, or somebody could murder him or whatever else. We're all weak. We're not that strong. And when it comes to fighting sin, uh, we're very weak. And that's why it's talking about here in the first two verses there, you know, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you know, why in back in James chapter 5, I think it's verse 16, talks about confessing your faults one to another and praying one for another, you know. But if a man be overtaken in a fault, we that are spiritual, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Very important, okay. Don't think because some brother over here had messed around with adultery or something like that in fornication, don't say, well, I'm not tempted in that way. It'll never happen to me. Any sin can happen to you if you let your guard down. You know, you know it says there about uh, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Be very careful because there are certain doors that can be opened up that let sin into your life. Make sure to keep those doors shut. You say, give me an example. Okay, television. Television is the greatest door that can put images, satanic images, into your mind. The greatest one. Why? You can't control it. I mean, here on YouTube, you know, you really, some things aren't really in your control either. I mean, you know, you look up a, you know, I was, I was uh, looking up some research and things on trucks and whatever else, different types of trucks, you know, uh, thinking about eventually getting a heavy-duty work truck, you know, and, and for back on the property. Um, and, you know, just looking up trucks and I get these videos, people using, you know, all this profanity and, and women in bikinis and stuff like this. And I'm just going, I'm just trying to find a truck, you know, you know, so again, you have to be careful, especially online. There's a lot of doors that can be opened that can bring sin into your life. And if you see some brother or even a sister that, you know, has gotten messed up, by looking at things online or by whatever other sins are out there, consider yourself, lest thou also be tempted. But it's interesting there, you say, um, you know, well, it says, if a man's overtaken in a fault, restore such an one, you know, in the spirit of meekness. So this guy sinned, and so we'll just accept him right back in. No, that's not the word restore. You know, let me put up a little picture here. Here you have a before and an after of a probably a it says 1955 Chevy, you know, car there. 1955 Chevy car here before and after. Now you look at the before picture. There's a lot of rust. The windows are broken out. Doesn't have a bumper. No, not much chrome on it, you know, and everything else. But what about that after picture? Well, that after picture, the car looks brand new again. Now see. I don't know if you've ever restored a vehicle, but that process right there takes usually five to ten minutes to do that, depending on how good you are.
to go from the old beat up car to the brand new looking car? Five to 10 minutes. You say you're crazy. Well, I would be if I was actually being serious. No, it takes a little bit longer than five to 10 minutes. In fact, it's more like five to 10 years sometimes, unless you have a lot of money and you can do it quickly. But I've known a lot of people that have fixed up old cars and things like that, and there's just a multitude of things to do. I mean, you get an old vehicle like that, you got all that rust that you got to get in there. You can't just all spray, spray paint over rust. That doesn't work. You have to cut that rusted metal out. A lot of times you'll re-weld metal in there and grind the welds down. Or if it's not too bad of a rusted area, you can put cut the rust out of there and put, they have, I think it's called navel jelly or something like that, that you spray in there that stops the metal from rusting anymore. And you can put putty in there, body putty and there's a lot of things, little little tips and tactics that you can do to restore an old car. And then you got to go and you got to find the old parts. You got to find the chrome bumpers. You got to go to car shows. You got to find them online, wherever else you can get them. It takes years to restore, restore something that has a lot of problems. And when you get a Christian that has messed up and messed up and messed up and messed up, and they are now really far away from the Lord in terms of fellowship, and they're really, really messed up in a lot of sin, it's going to take a lot of work to restore such an one. Okay? A whole lot of work. That's a good reason why you want to live as clean as possible. Because there are avenues that you can take in your life as a Christian that can get you messed up, and sometimes you can't get back again. All right? You say, give me an example, okay? Adultery. I've known of a lot of Christians that have gone through adultery and divorce. You can't get back to that first marriage ever again. Once that marriage is split up and you remarry and they remarry and things like that, and there's, you know, whatever else, you can't go back to that first marriage. Better think about that before you get married. And see... I've known Christians that have gone and, and have had trouble after trouble after trouble after trouble, and now they're someplace and everything's just falling apart for them, and they're, they're saved, and they're going, how did it ever get this bad, you know? And what do you do as a Christian? You just say, I'm writing you off because you've messed up in sin. You're, you're scum. Get away from me. No, that's not what you do. You restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, understanding, hey, this brother or sister... I could be in the same situation if I let myself go. And they want to change. They want to come back to having that right relationship. They want to come back to being in good fellowship with the Lord. So I'm going to restore them. I'm going to help to restore them. I'm going to show them how to get that rust out of their life, how to get those dents out of their life, how to, how to get back right with the Lord. Restore such in one. See? That's what's going on there. But look at uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 3. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. <laughs> also very, very good. And you say, well, but, uh, you know, Paul, he certainly was somebody, wasn't he? Well, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7. Let's begin reading here. He says here, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Wait a second. The Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, and he says, Unto me, who am less than least of all saints, not, he didn't even say, I'm you know, the least of the apostles. He said, in that passage, he said, the least of all saints. Wow. See, that's the right attitude to have. Don't get too big. Don't get too prideful. Don't think, I'm really somebody. You know, I'm really, you know, wonderful and everything. You know, I am something. Well, you're probably nothing <laughs> if you think that you're something. Don't deceive yourself. Stay humble. Galatians chapter 6, verse 4. But let, it, let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. You can go to Romans chapter 15. You keep your hand there in Galatians chapter 6 because we'll be coming back there. 
but Romans chapter 15. We're going to see about this thing about let every man prove his own work. Okay, it says here, I have, Romans chapter 15, verse 17, excuse me. I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. For I will, I will not dare to speak of any of these of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as, but as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. Now, of course, you know, yes, I know in the first century, Christianity was very small, and as it was growing, it was spreading out more and more and more. So it was like, okay, somebody's here in this city, I'm going to go over to that city. Well, most places now, you're not going to find too many places where, you know, no one's ever heard of Jesus Christ or the truth is not available. Most places have internet, you know, whatever else. They can get online and find out about Jesus Christ in 30 seconds. You know, I understand that. But one other way that a lot of people will, you know, do this thing of building upon another man's foundation is what is actually condemned over in chapter 5 of Galatians, and that is emulations. What is emulation? Well, basically lifting a man up on a, up on a pedestal and then trying to copy him and imitate him. And we're not supposed to do that as Christians. A lot of these big, huge Babel buildings, they inspire followings of young men that try to mimic the big cult leader. Perfect example, and probably one of the worst examples out there, I'm going to be talking more about this guy in the future, is Jack Hiles. You have Hiles Anderson College, and you have all these little Jack Hiles, you know, wannabe guys going around wanting to be the next big Jack Hiles, big preacher and stuff like that. Jack Hiles was one of the most wicked, most uh, prideful men. And I found out some things about that guy. I don't even think he was saved. Some of the things that that man was doing. And, you know, you, whoa, what? You know, the, he was a champion of the King James Bible. Uh, uh, I'm going to be talking about him in the future. But the point is, this guy, you know, is a very, very wicked man. And... Uh, and actually, I'm recording this, you know, these Galatians studies here uh, in early May. So it could be when I say I'm going to talk about him in the future, it could be all I've actually talked about him before we get to this week's study. But be careful about going to one of these big buildings with that's a cult of personality and then building upon that man's foundation. All right, trying to imitate him and do exactly what he did and whatever else. Uh, the fact of the matter is you have to be your own man when it comes to serving the Lord. You can't build off of another man's foundation. All right? uh, find out what the Lord wants you to do and then do it. And of course, you know, I'm not saying don't listen to anybody else or you know, don't you know, spread my videos out there. Whatever. I know I have a lot of brethren that, that take my videos and put them on a, uh, another channel and a dear brother that puts them on Sermon Audio. You know, stuff like that. That's fine. I'm just simply saying, you know, you will have to, at some point in time, you know, uh, the Lord's going to open doors for you to do ministry of your own, whether witnessing to, to co-workers or friends, family, whatever. You know, that's going to be very important. You know, you're going to have to prove your own work, as it says there in Galatians chapter 6, verse 4. But uh, let's look at verse 5 here. Galatians chapter 6, verse 5. You can go back there if you're still in Romans. Galatians 6, verse 5. For every man shall bear his own burden. Did you know uh, being in service to the Lord is oftentimes a burden? Yeah. Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 4. This is interesting here, an interesting tie-in. Um, it says here, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All there whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, 
but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Ah, see, that's what's going on here in the church of Galatia. These Galatian believers, they're being told by these Jews, you have to keep the law. You have to go back under the Old Testament. You have to do all these things. You have to be circumcised, and you have to keep the feast days, and you have to this, and you have to that, and you have to keep the Ten Commandments, and all these other things. They're putting this huge burden onto the shoulders of those believers in Galatia. They're saying, you have to do all this stuff to be saved. And the fact of the matter is, they're telling them that when they themselves aren't doing it themselves. You know, when they when they themselves can't do it. Excuse me. When they When these... Jews that are coming and saying you need to do all this, keep the law and everything, they can't do it. You know, they aren't able to do all these things. See, just like the Pharisees and the, and the scribes there that are sitting in Moses' seat. See, they're putting this heavy burden on people, but they themselves can't even keep it. You know, pretty bad. But uh, Romans chapter 14, verses 10 through 12, we'll read this quick here. It says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. As it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. That's why Galatians chapter 6, verse 5 said, For every man shall bear his own burden. You're going to give account of yourself to God someday. You're not going to be able to hide behind a preacher or behind some kind of internet ministry or anything. You're going to have to bear your own burden, and you're going to have to give an account before God. Just as simple as that. Galatians chapter 6, verse 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. All right. You say, well, then I should talk to the, you know, write emails and stuff to the guy and talk to him and whatever else that I learn from. Well, you know, some of that's okay, but that's not all that's being covered here. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 through 20 says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. And then it goes on to say, Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses, them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. So, Elders there, also known as pastor or whatever, somebody that's teaching the Bible, they're not above rebuke, okay? But um, you should count them worthy of double honor, right? And that is, what's double honor? Well, you have honor as in respect. You have honor as in, in the context there, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and labor is worthy of his reward. You also have, you know, donating to that person, to see they're doing the work of the Lord, so you're donating to them to keep them going. You know, that's what it says there in Galatians 6, 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. All right? And that doesn't mean that you have to make the guy into a millionaire or something like that, a preacher into that. No, no. It's just if you see, hey, he's doing the work of the Lord. I'd like to have part of that ministry. I'd like to be able to keep him going. Then do that. All right. And as I've said in the past, people say, you know, I'd like to donate to your ministry. Thank you. I appreciate that. People say, I don't want to donate to your ministry. I don't think that, you know, that's something I should do. Okay, fine. Then don't, you know, but uh, make sure that you donate to somebody. You make sure that you give back some of what God has given you in terms of your money. You know, give some money to Fellowship Track League. Give some money to local church Bible publishers, you know. Find somebody that's doing the work of the Lord and give money towards them. If you've been taught in the word by them, then you communicate back to them in all good things. That's what's going on. Galatians chapter 6, verse uh, 7 and 8. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Did you know that that is a scientific law? The law of sowing and reaping? Heard a really good message the one time by a preacher named Brian Donovan 
on the law of sowing and reaping. And he said, if you sow to the flesh, you will to the flesh reap corruption. You know, don't say to your, or don't think to yourself that you can smoke cigarettes for 30 years and just get away with it. It's going to come back. You're going to have some kind of a health problem because of that. And it goes with everything. Don't think that you can play video games for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and not reap some corruption from that. It will destroy your mind, it will destroy your eyes, and it will destroy your health. So give me some more examples. Okay, eating the wrong kind of food. You eat fast food for 20 years and see where it gets you. Uh, look at pornography for years and years and years and years and years to see what kind of clean mind you have. Listen to rock music. See how much concentration you have when it co comes time to read the Word of God. See, anything at all, any time that you mess around with sin, you are sowing to the flesh. And the result of that is, to the flesh, you will reap corruption. You know, it's like you put corn seeds into the ground, you're going to get corn. You're not going to get alfalfa or, or asparagus or strawberries. Okay, you put a corn seed in the ground, it's going to come up a corn stalk. And if you sow to the flesh through wickedness and sin, it will come back. It will come up. Sin has serious consequences. You need to remember that. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. There's one of those pesky little if words again. You know, it's a conditional clause. You will reap if you faint not. Let me show you what I mean. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. But look at verse 5. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive for lawfully. And I've said this thing many, many times in the past, and I'll say it another time. God's work must be done God's way. Simple. You say, brother, I preached from the NIV for 15 years. Okay, you're going to get zero rewards. Why? You're not preaching from God's word. You're preaching from a corrupt satanic counterfeit. Well, I've been in, I've been in the praise and worship band at, at uh, my Babel building and I, you know, have sung a lot of solos and stuff like that, and it, that's not God's music. CCM is not God's music. You can't honor God with that garbage. I used to be into the whole thing there, so don't tell me about it. I know about it. I know about the rock music and the heavy metal and everything else. I know about it. You can't honor God with that junk. Can't do it. God's work has to be done God's way. Just as simple as that. And if you don't strive lawfully, you're not going to be crowned. You know, going out and uh, winning souls, you know, by telling them that there's no repentance involved, there's no changed life that's necessary after salvation, you know, oh, don't, don't do that, that's offensive. The lost people can't understand that they're sinners and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, huh? you know what you're doing? You are striving unlawfully. You know what striving lawfully is? Going out and telling people you need to repent. You need to repent of your sins. All right? You are a sinner. Your self-righteousness is what's keeping you out of heaven. And until you repent, until you come to God as a broken, contrite sinner, you aren't going to be saved. It's as simple as that. And I, you can't change your life right now. So you can understand that you're a sinner, but you can't do anything about it until after you get saved. All right? Then the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you know, moves it within you, you become God's property, and now He can control you, and He can command you, get rid of this, get rid of that, get rid of that, get rid of that. See? There's no sense trying to do that before you get saved. You're just cleaning up a dead corpse. You know? 
You have to become a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old man is buried with him when you get saved. That's what baptism is all about. It shows that that death under the water, burial, you know, death going down, burial under the water, and resurrection coming up out of the water, a new creature in Christ Jesus. That's what's going on there. But continuing here, Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. It said there earlier, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. Now it's saying, be careful that no man take thy crown. What's going on? You get under the ministry of a false prophet, you'll lose crown of reward. You say, give me a good example. Okay. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I believe it is, where it talks about, you know, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. You see, if you're pre-trib, you're looking for the appearing of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the next thing to appear to you as a Christian, whether by life or death. See, I'm expecting to see Jesus Christ face to face next. Okay. But if you're anything but pre-trib, you're expecting to see the Antichrist next. Yeah. You are expecting the Antichrist has to show up on the world scene before you can see Jesus Christ. So you don't really love his appearing. See? So some false prophet comes along and he takes away your crown. You start to listen to Stephen Anderson or whatever other false prophet out there. Guess what? They take your crown from you. You're listening to a false prophet. Be careful. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Interesting because he's talking there, it's finishing up with Revelation chapter 3, talking about the church in Laodicea. The people's rights, the neither hot nor cold, lukewarm, disgusting, sick thing, saying, you know, I'm rich, increased with goods, I have need of nothing, you know. All that. Um, are you going to overcome it? Are you overcoming? Are you staying away from the modern Babel buildings and the modern versions and the modern rock music and the, all the other stuff? Are you overcoming? Well, the Bible says right there in Revelation 3.21 that if you can overcome this thing and you stay faithful right up until the rapture, you're actually going to get to sit with the Lord in His throne. That's not That promise isn't given to anybody else. important. And the sad thing is I think a lot of Christians aren't going to make it to the rapture. I'm seeing Christian after Christian after Christian falling away from the true gospel, falling away from what the Bible really says. They're getting messed up. They're not going to make it. I pray that you do. And please pray for me that the Lord spares me enough that I can make it into that time. And I'm not saying that, you know, you're not going to make it to the rapture, meaning you're going to stay here. I don't mean that. No. Uh, you're rolling up if you're saved. What I'm saying is, are you going to be faithful to the Lord? I hope so. Revelation chapter 6 verse, or, yeah, Revelation. Galatians chapter 6 verse 10. We'll go back there. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. If people need help, it should be other brothers and sisters that you help first. Because if you have somebody who has no need for Jesus Christ, say a neighbor or something like that, and you do a whole lot of things to help them, and they don't want anything to do with the Lord, and they don't, don't witness to me, shut up, I, don't, I hate Christianity, I hate the Bible, whatever else, what are you wasting your time on them for? You know? I mean, you know, I understand that you're not going to just be like, witness to somebody and, and they say, I don't want to hear it. And you go, okay, fine. You can go to hell. You can, you can die for all I can. No, you don't have to do that. But what I'm saying is you should try to do good. And when you have opportunity, do good unto all men, but especially those who are of the household of faith. If you have two options, a Christian needs help and a lost person needs help, help the Christian. First and foremost, that's what's going on there. 
Galatians chapter 6, verses 11 through 13. A lot of people, by the way, replace witnessing and soul winning with good deeds. Watch out for that too. But Galatians chapter 6, verses 11 through 13 says, Ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. As we've been talking about throughout this whole study, these Jews are coming along trying to get these Galatian believers and trying to say, you have to go and get back under the law and things like that, and you have to look like Jews and act like Jews so that we can glory in your flesh. So we can say, oh, look, we got more Jews, we got more converts, more people in our synagogue. <laughs> you know, bad thing. And what was one of the reasons? You know, what's one of the reasons that uh, people try to get away from real, true Bible believing Christianity? Well, because you will suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. That is guaranteed, 100% guaranteed, that that will happen to you if you are truly saved. You will be persecuted because of being a true Christian. And so you get off into kooky other systems of belief to avoid that persecution. Bad thing. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Huh. Did you know that that term new creature only appears twice in your King James Bible? Both times written to a Christian. A new creature. What's the other one? I quote all the time, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So you see it two times in the Pauline epistles. You're to be a new creature, born again. The old man is dead, buried with Christ. You see, when you get saved, when the Lord saves you, when God saves you, you understand that? God saves you. Okay? When that happens, what the transaction is that takes place there is God looks at this wicked, dirty sinner and he says, Okay, I'm going to take my blood and I'm going to wash those sins away. And that wicked, old, dirty sinner, I'm going to take him, I'm going to bury him in the grave. When Jesus died on the cross, that's that sinner dying. And when Jesus rose from the dead, that righteousness, that sinless character is now the new man, that new believer. And now I own him. Now God owns you. That's why he tells you what to do with your life. That's why he commands you. And if you don't listen, that's why he chastens you. See, that's how this whole thing works. That's why you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. That's why there has to be the new birth. If it's not there, if there's not been a new birth, then you're not saved. It's just as simple as that. Galatians chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. We'll finish up here. It says, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God, from henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Interesting there, he said, the marks of the Lord Jesus. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Um, you will notice that. You might not be whipped or beaten or things like that. Paul was whipped. He was beaten. You know, he didn't die on the cross, but, uh, you know, he came pretty close. But you will notice the fellowship of the sufferings that you will go through with the Lord Jesus Christ, the things that He had happened to Him, those same things are going to happen in your life. And you're going to get to a point where you're going to realize what the Lord is doing for me, what the Lord is doing through me, 
I'm going through the persecution and everything else, and you're going to get people that are going to be like, I don't think you're real. I don't think you're this. I think you're you're a troublemaker and stuff like that. And you're just going to be like, you know what? Let no man trouble me. That stuff doesn't even bother me anymore. You know, the things that, that at first seem very scary, the persecution that comes from friends and family, the persecution that comes from other people online or co-workers, whatever, that persecution that comes at first, it's, it is scary. But as time goes by and you realize what the thing is all about, that you realize you're being persecuted for the Lord and whatever, you just get to a point where you're like, doesn't even bother me anymore. Let no man bother me. Yeah, whatever. Oh, religious fanatic, bigot, narrow-minded, hypocrite, judgmental. And you just look and you go, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you know, that's where you'll get to. You know, I, it, it's it's rough at first. I mean, if you're newly saved and you're experiencing some of this stuff and you're and you're getting down, um, in due season you will reap, if you faint not. Stick with it. Stick with it. You know, uh, the Lord will the Lord will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able to bear. Okay, whatever you're going through, you'll come out of it. Don't worry about that. You know, I've I've went through some rough times early on in ministry, and and I you know kind of went in a little bit headstrong at different times, and it was just kind of you know making mistakes and whatever else, and so I had to kind of slow down a little bit, back off a little bit, and you know the Lord slowly built the ministry up because I you know what I am am dealing with right now I couldn't have dealt with back in 2008 when I first came on YouTube, uh, no way. Um, I couldn't handle it. And the Lord has been gracious enough to just slowly build the ministry up and, and it grows and grows and grows and grows and grows as time goes by. And I'm so thankful for that. But the weight of the burden that gets upon you when you're really in ministry, you know, very, the, the ministry gets bigger and bigger. It's a lot at times. But you know what? In due season, we shall reap if we faint not. I tell myself that a lot. It will be worth it all one day. It's all going to be worth it. And even if you, you know, I'm not trying to say if you don't have a ministry like mine, you're scummers. No, 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 no. You know, whatever ministry the Lord has given you, whatever uh, He is, He is uh, committed to your trust, so to speak. Um, whatever it is. I mean, you might be a stay-at-home mother and just trying to teach your your baby or whatever else and witness to occasional friends and family and they call you crazy. And Whatever your sphere of influence, whatever ministry God has given to you, um, stick with it. You know, I, I don't know how much longer, you know, we'll even be online or whatever else. I mean, the persecution is going to get worse and worse and worse. I realize that. You know, I don't know if we're going to go right up until the rapture or whatever. But no matter what happens, my prayer for you is that you stay with the King James Bible. You stay by your convictions. Don't back down. Okay? Keep in mind, keep focused on eternity. I can't say that enough. You know, remember that you are going to have to stand before God someday. And you will bear your own burden. You will give account of your own life to God. And you will have to look into the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ and say, I didn't quit. Or hang your head and say, I'm sorry. I couldn't make it. I listened to the wrong people. And, you know, I, I just want to make a comment on that too. Don't listen to these false prophets out there. You know, when I tell people don't listen to Steven Anderson and don't li listen to Martin Richling and don't listen to this guy and that guy and whatever else, I'm not trying to take away your fun, okay? I've been in ministry for a while now and I studied over 10 years before I even got on YouTube too. So, you know, it's been a long time that I've been really studying, you know, full time and things. I'm telling you to stay away from certain ministries because I have experience with those types of ministries, I know it will destroy you. I know it will destroy your faith. I know it will destroy your walk with the Lord. That's why I'm saying stay away from these guys. False prophets. You know, stay away from them. 
Because what happens when you start to listen to false prophets, they will tear you down. You know, and before long, you're going to be out. You're going to be off base from where you need to be. So, be very careful to stay in the pages of this book and be encouraged. Because if you can make it to the rapture without giving up on the things that you have learned and been assured of, you will sit with the Lord in His throne. According to Revelation chapter 3 there. What an amazing promise. Okay? Stand by the things of the Lord. So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I just uh, thank you so much for the book of Galatians. It's such a very important reminder, Lord, that we, we should not seek to go back under the Old Testament and seek to uh, do all kinds of sanctions and special things to purify our flesh, Lord. We need to just accept who we are. We are just sinners saved by grace and need to do what we can to keep away from sin, Lord. But most of that is just serving you. If we serve you, Lord, we will stay away from sin. And Lord, I just, uh, I really do pray for the people out there that are watching this, that, that they would stay true to, to the things that they have learned and been assured of, that they would not fall for these lying false prophets. And uh, Lord, I just am really praying um, that you would help me too. I'm not uh, invincible or whatever. I, I'm very vulnerable, Lord. And uh, I can fall very easily, just as easily as any other Christian. I don't have some special sanctification in me or whatever else that I'll never fall. I know my, the weakness of my flesh. So I just pray, Lord, for, for uh, myself and my wife, our ministry here, Lord. I thank you for the different things that you've given to us to, to do, to bring out. And I just pray, Lord, for the strength to, to be able to stay with it right up until the end. And, uh, but more importantly, Lord, as all the other brothers and sisters out, out there that are really trying to do right, I just pray, Lord, that they would be encouraged and that they would stay on that right path uh, the whole way up until eternity, uh, which begins at the rapture, really. And so, Lord, I just uh, ask all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That is it for Galatians. As I said last week, um, I'm going to be starting to get back to the real calling of the ministry here, and that is subject preaching. Um, that's something that I have always had a very keen interest in simply because, you know, there's a lot of subjects you have questions on, and I always had questions, and it was just like I looked for answers to a lot of these questions, couldn't find them. And so that's why the Lord really placed a burden in my heart to, you know, really focus in on what about this subject? What about that subject? You know, whatever. So that's what I'm really going to try to get back to. And um, Lord willing, I'll, you know, I, I will be getting back to expository studies eventually too. I'm not going to totally give up expository preaching. But uh, we'll see. Uh, for now, I do thank you for watching. As always, we thank all the people out there who pray for the ministry, all the people that donate to the ministry. We are eternally grateful for everybody's support. So that will be it for this study. And um, we will see you next week with a, I'm not sure what the topic will be yet, but uh, we will definitely start working on, on answering a lot of people's questions and sermon requests and things like that. So that's it for the book of Galatians. Thank you very much for watching.